all stand.
the truth older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light overwhelms the darkness there is a kingdom that forever reigns there is freedom from the chains that bind us Jesus Jesus who walks on the waters who speaks to
All right. Good evening. Great to be with you tonight. It's great to be out on a Sunday night. Great to be a part of uh, this week. This is a great week for uh, for believers, right? For the world, it's a great week. They just don't know it. We heard it this morning about Pilate. So I'm going to take care of a couple of things, and then I'm going to say some things about uh, the play and Easter in general. So are you okay with that? Okay. Well, we're going to do it anyway. So just letting you, preparing you for that, that that's what's coming, all right? And, you know, and, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, if you're a visitor with us tonight, I want to thank you for being with us, and we have something for you at the Welcome Center. If you're a guest here at Greater Grace, it's your first time, stop by there. They have something for you, and uh, it's a guest card, and it includes a free uh, coffee or tea at our cafe there, so uh, you can fellowship around that card there. Also, uh, this week, our play begins on Tuesday. Uh, the first performance is at 7 p.m., and then also on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 7 p.m. And every day this week, 1 o'clock, around that time, uh, groups will be going out to pass out the, the, the tickets that we have. We still have a number of those. And uh, yard signs, I think we still have some yard signs available if you'd like to put those on, on your property. <laughs> yard signs on your property. That's the safest way to do it. It does have ggwo.org on there. So if you put it somewhere else that's not proper, then... They'll come after us. So uh, anyway, uh, so uh, just enjoy it. Also on Good Friday, we'll be having a gathering here, time of communion and just reflection on that, that moment uh, in, the, in the Easter season. So you're welcome to be a part of that on Friday. So just really have great expectation for that. So uh, the Easter play, it's like interesting because um, how do these things happen? This is art. You know, and art is interesting. Artists have a way of seeing things, you know. And, uh, you know, Pastor Mati sees things a certain way, and they, they come alive in colors on, on canvas like that. And uh, you, can, uh, you can understand it or not understand it. That's the great thing about art. It's not meant for everyone to be understood. Is that okay? You know, okay, so the Easter play is a piece of art, and it is... A, I did have this idea last year at the end of the play that there's an old movie. I'm not going to tell you what that movie is because someone, I will be responsible for someone going to watch this movie and it's not such a good movie to watch. Uh, and the way it ends is very tragically with this strobe light of this woman fading out as she dies. And it's like, a, it's a strobe light and she, like three or four strobe lights and it goes. And I said, man, that would be like, it would be really awesome if like the thief on the cross just like faded out. But then instead of it being death, all of a sudden he's in paradise. So maybe I've spoiled the plot for you, but that's really the way it is. How do you see resurrection from the other side? You know, and this is the, this is the whole point of the, the drama this year. So I have an idea in the way this works. I have an idea. I work it out my own in the theater of my own brain. And then I turn it over to the director and the cast and they work with it and it, and it comes out reasonably similar to what I had in mind, but that's just, just the way the team works, you know, because the actors get into their characters and they have to act like themselves to present it like that. And so this is, you know, this time of year has always been like, um, if you grew up like I did in a, in a traditional, uh, in a traditional, traditional, traditional kind of church where the stations of the cross were portrayed and Easter was like a big deal and on Good Friday you kissed the feet of Jesus on a, on a crucifix, that's where I went. You know, you understand like uh, some of the powerful elements that can, that um, symbol and type and demonstration can bring you into. Like in that traditional church, I can remember sitting singing the things and kneeling and doing everything that somebody and having like very, like a couple of, at least on three occasions in the middle of the, of the, what's called the mass, uh, sensing that God was there. And I'm looking at the old lady next to me and the guy next to me wondering if they're feeling the same thing I'm feeling, you know, God would speak in symbol and God would speak in type. And Jesus spoke in many parables to open the hearts of people. You know, why would he speak in parables? Why would we put on an Easter play? We don't answer all the theological questions like what is paradise and why is Abraham there? Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, that's, you know, that's 
That's something for Bible college. Hopefully someone will get saved at the Easter play and they'll show up in Bible college and go to Pastor Wright's uh, survey of doctrine class and understand why and what the afterlife is all about. But, um, you know, bring, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these moments, uh, these moments, these, uh, these moments that we have this week, um, I, I would say just have, I have a great expectation I watched the thing through yesterday, and I can really sense the, the, the spirit of the people entering into their characters, and it's like, you know, it's like, uh, it's, you know, people, people in this body enter into their characters. It could be Jerry Roberts as Al Capone Satan a few years ago. Still one of my favorite Satans ever. He didn't say a word. He just walked around with the top hat and took it off every now and then. It was like amazing, right? You didn't have any lines that year, did you? Just a few, you know, so that, you know, people enter into their characters. Our Pharisees, they have been faithfully Pharisaical. <laughs> and we're, you know, we enjoy watching them do that. And, uh, you know, and Jesus, the Jesuses that we have had have been like, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to enter into. So, uh, you know, you have an expectation for this week. Just really believe God is going to use the lines and the presence and the spirit and the prayers of the people. And, uh, you know, that God will fill these seats with people who are lost. You know, and here's a, here, can you do me a favor? Like, if you are a member of this church and you see a lost person up here, could you help them to the front and maybe give up your seat too? Like, you know, because I know that we all want to see it and we want to see, you know, the tears on Jesus's face and the blood flow and everything like that. But like, you know, if there's a, if there's a visitor here, like, let's get them up close so they can really like get the sense of what the, I'm really interested. Did you talk to the Syrians this morning about the cross? Did you? Yeah, I'm just wondering how they, because, you know, you know, if you're from that background and you see the cross, it's like, kind of like, whoa, and there's the pictures of the cross that we had this morning. So just, I would just say, this is like really like a time in our church that has been like, uh, is a time when just really just that we can really have an expectation that the, that people who are lost will see something in, in this imagery and uh, just, just ask God to cover the cast, all the voices, help them to remember their lines, to be in character, the lights, the camera, the action, all that stuff is like really vital and you do that, and uh, just that's, that's what makes a church service. A church service is what we expect it to be. I'm just like saying the pastor prepares, he comes up here, he's anointed, but like the congregation, we really have like a, you know, we really have like a, a, a very big part in the expectation that comes from here. So the expectation that you'll bring to every performance this week is really important. It's like, so let's not be casual about it. Let's not be familiar with it. Let's just believe God for just like a great several performances this week and just see God add to our church. Okay? All right. So that's it. Now Pastor Dwayne's coming to ask you for money. <laughs> okay, good evening. Good evening. If we can have the ushers get ready to receive our offering. Um, just a, a thought, we will be bringing a group up from Harold Harbor to the play on Saturday night also. So we're pretty excited about that. Just a thought here. Um, what is today? What is next Sunday? April Fool's, correct. Next Sunday, we'll be preaching down in Harold Harbor on the greatest April fool there has ever been and why he is a fool, obviously because of the resurrection, okay, Easter, okay? Um, but today being Palm Sunday, there was an incident that took place historically the day before Palm Sunday, and that was in Bethany in Simon the leper's house where they were gathered to eat and Mary brought out an alabaster box and broke it and poured the oil out, the ointment, the burial ointment, on the head, body, and feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And incidentally, within the past year, her brother died and she never used that ointment on her brother. It was a life savings ointment. You know, you save up for this and you actually save it for your own burial. 
And she didn't use it for her brother, but she used it for Jesus. And, you know, the, you know, the criticism comes and Jesus says, whoa, stop. Don't criticize her because she is going to be remembered for this offering that she has poured out upon me for all time to come. And here we are talking about it today. See, our offering isn't to be poured out upon the natural. It's not a natural offering. For her to use that offer, to use that ointment or that oil on her brother or even herself would have been natural. And incidentally, it would have been a waste. That would have been a waste to use it on Lazarus because Lazarus was raised from the dead. But on turn, it was like, oh, what waste is this being used on Jesus? It's not a waste because it's supernatural. It's spiritual. And that's what our offerings are to be. If we give our money in the online or in the offering plate or whatever, if we just give our money to God in the natural, it's a waste. But if we give it to God spiritually, supernaturally, it's a memorial and it will never be forgotten. Amen? So, Father, we pray that you would bless this offering and use it for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you. That was good, wasn't it? That was like spiritual dinner music. <laughs> huh? Was that, is that how you kind of felt? Very relaxing, like, you know, pass the water, please. And, yeah, it was so nice. <laughs> it was good. Really good. Really good. We had a beautiful day today in the Lord. We did. We had an amazing morning here. Les, good to see you. I said to Pastor Adam Speedy this morning, send me an email. He's sitting behind me. I think it was Pastor Adam. Send me an email saying, where is Les? <laughs> so I'll be getting that email, but I got the answer already. There he is. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Uh, good. We, you want to have a little fun here tonight? A little bit, and not too much, though. All right, a little bit. It's a big subject. It's a big one. It's amazing. It's a big one. And I think it could develop into a excellent message. Uh, just for the sake the, of the folks that were not here this morning, I don't know if I can do this. I think I can. Okay. Uh, let's have a prayer. Amen. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the music, the band, Rachel's words, her voice, our spirit tonight, our day, the days we are living in, the value of every life, the value of our decisions, and lead us in your anointing in Harold Harbor, Hav de Grace, Pastor Jay Esterbrook this morning with Pastor Shibeli, Pastor Shibley, uh, Federal Hill, many others. Thank you, Lord. Minister to us, and amen, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this morning, we did the uh, signs of the times, and by the way, we had a, a Syrian family come this morning who have been for one month kind of contacting me. I met them at Rocky Point. And uh, they said, can you come and visit us at our house? I said, yes, but I traveled, I came back, and then they called me yesterday. I said, come to church this morning. They came, uh, five children, uh, mom and dad, from Aleppo, Syria. Uh, the lady had seen her brother, she brother shot to death right in front of her. The dad had lost two brothers in the Civil War. And a real, real family that has immigrated here 
and is uh, hungry to be loved, hungry to be in the United States. They've been here 14 months. And the, these are the kind of people that we are, that we just say God has put us here. And these are people that are searching. And um, we have a play this week, and we're just out there inviting and working and serving and loving. Uh, so I, I'm so excited in my heart. Signs of the Times. This is the end time series. We started our series uh, for our spring. And we went through this in the last few weeks. And this morning briefly, then the rapture. And the rapture happening and. Uh, we anticipate it. We know it's going to happen any time. There are no conditions that need to be met in order for that to happen. In a moment, we will be raised up. We will be gone out of the graves and ascend up and meet Christ in the air. He will take us to heaven as his bride. And there we will be decorated with our righteousnesses through the Bema Seat. This is the next part. The judgment seat of the believer, or the Bema seat. And we had a list uh, that I mentioned this morning, and I'll just mention a few of them, <clears throat> if I can find it. It's easier to read the list quickly. <clears throat> Uh, we will be judged at the Bema Seat without condemnation. There is not any uh, judgment that produces guilt, only the sense of loss. Like when the lights go on and we realize God's reality, we will see it in the context of our new life. That because of our new life, we actually had the heart of God. And many things that we did in this life were in accordance with his will. And his Holy Spirit led us. His Holy Spirit filled us. So therefore, we treated other believers with a glass of water, Matthew 10, 41. We used our given talents and gifts and redeemed the time. We used our money. We gave money for orphans and widows and to help the local assembly and to do mission work. This will be seen at the Bema seat. God will search our hearts. We had amazing services this morning where I felt the spirit like searching our hearts and speaking to us about the importance of having a pastor teacher. Hebrews 13.7, 13.17. To be part of an assembly and not forsake the assembly, but to show up. And there where God is speaking by his spirit, the masters of assemblies, zzz, zzz, in the GM, uh, General Motors assembly line, where the goads and the nails are fastened in our lives, where we remember teachings from the past that were revolutionary. One brother came here this morning for the first time. He met me at the door. He said, that was amazing. That was amazing. Then, then he followed me into the cafeteria. That was amazing. That was amazing. It was so edifying. You know, it doesn't have to be amazing in one sense. We're not here for that reason. But we are here because God has given words, words of wisdom from one shepherd, and that's Christ. And he's given us words. And we remember messages from 30 years ago. These are nails that, that connected us with God's eternal purpose and at the Bema seat of the believer, we will be seeing that our life was not in vain, that we had value. And I want to speak a little later about closure, about how things can be put away and sealed and gone and dealt with, because we are living in a world that is crying out for Barabbas. 
Barabbas in Matthew 27. Pontius Pilate and Christ are there together, and Pilate has no idea. He has no idea of the import of the moment, the profundity of this event, that we'd be speaking about it forever and ever, that Pilate and Christ meet. And Pilate says, what is truth? And Pilate says, who are you? And don't you know I have power to release you? And on it goes in that exchange with a few words. It has not changed globally now. The world is meeting Christ. And the world does not know what is truth. And Christ is standing there. And in effect, he is saying, I am truth. I am the answer for all your problems, Punctious Pilate. I am the answer for your guilt. I am the answer for your disease and sickness, your excuses for your political future. I am the answer for your life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am God's wisdom incarnated. I am what you need. But you don't know that. So Pilate is in a politically difficult situation. The crowd is yelling, crucify. He is saying, I can let somebody go free. Who should I set free, Barabbas or the one called Christ? Barabbas, Barabbas. Okay. Let me say, read a piece to you. Whatever, the fun part I wanted to do tonight, I don't know if it'll happen. <laughs> but the fun part was, have you any, ever met somebody who has some sickness or problem and they label it with a disease label? And when you walk away, you wonder, is it actually a disease or is it an excuse? Have you ever met somebody that talks about their problems, their misfortunes, their disabilities in the context of a disease? Whatever happened to the word sin, it's not used today. Actually, there's a lot written about it. There are... Um, <clears throat> many ways of explaining it away. An FBI agent was fired after he embezzled $2,000, gambled it away in a single afternoon at a casino. Later, he sued, arguing that his gambling addiction was a disability. So his firing was an act of illegal discrimination. He won the case. Moreover, his therapy for the gambling addiction had to be funded under his employer's health care insurance, just as if he had been suffering from appendicitis. Wow. You know the story. Alcoholism, it's a disease, right? Uh, sometimes forms of rebellion with young people can be simply attention deficit disorder. It seems that the psychologists are busy inventing names and labels because we want Barabbas to go free. It's only a thought. I don't want to make a case and argue it with people that do have legitimate problems. I understand that. But I'm trying to say something. The evangelical church that is saying guilt is an is a absolute part of a person's psyche. That guilt is a reality. That guilt is something that the, the world of psychology is trying to excuse it and eliminate it and say, you're not guilty, you just need a better self-image. Get rid of guilt, that is old-fashioned. Guilt is no longer a part of our life. This is the idea. We have, uh, these days, everything wrong with humanity is likely to be explained as an illness. 
What we used to call sin is more easily diagnosed as a whole array of disabilities. All kinds of immorality and evil conduct, conduct are now identified as symptoms of this or that psychological illness. Criminal behavior, perverse passions, every imaginable addiction have all been made excusable by the crusade to label them medical afflictions. Even commonplace problems such as emotional weakness, depression, anxiety are all also almost universally defined as quasi-medical rather than spiritual. The American Psychiatric Association publishes a thick book to help therapists in the diagnosis of these new diseases, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It is, uh, yes, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, histrionic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. There are dozens, multitudes of parents influenced by diagnoses refuse to punish their children for misbehavior. Instead, they seek therapy for ODD or HDP or whatever new diagnosis fits the unruly child's behavior. In the words of one author, the disease model approach to human behavior has so overwhelmed us as a society that we have gone haywire. We want to pass laws to excuse compulsive gamblers when they embezzle money to gamble, to force insurance companies to pay to treat them. We want to treat people who can't find love and who instead go after dopey, superficial men or when per, uh, women pursue endless, or men, endless sexual uh, relations without finding true happiness, and we want to call all these things and many, many more addictions. What is this new addiction industry meant to accomplish? More and more addictions are being discovered. New addicts are being identified until all of us will be locked into our own little addictive worlds with other addicts like ourselves defined by the special interests of our neuroses. What a repug repugnant world to imagine, as well as a hopeless one. Meanwhile, all the addictions we define are increasing. And on it goes. Think about it. You go to a church like this one, and we say, where's our responsibility? What is it are we to relate to? Are we to excuse ourselves for our misbehaviors, for my sexual addictions, my alcoholism, or my drug addictions, or my whining, or crying, or my complaining, or my race, or my background, or my upbringing, or how my mom treated me, or my dad, or my unemployment, or whatever it might be? Come on. We say, set Barabbas free. Now think about it. Barabbas was a murderer. He was a criminal. But in that little world of Israel, with that leader, Pontius Pilate, in Christ, the world is speaking. And the world is saying, uh, you know, Jesus touched a nerve with us. He touched a nerve. He went where he shouldn't go. We don't like him. He put his finger on us. He's like saying we are proud and blind We, as a nation. This is not the Jewish people. These are the leaders of the Jewish people. I, the Jewish people loved Christ and received him gladly, largely. And he did amazing things for the common people. But I am trying to say something. The same thing is happening in our world. They don't want Christ. They want the excuses. They don't want Christ. They, they want some way out. They don't want Christ. They don't want the cross. They don't want the truth. They don't want the reality. And so it just goes, listen to it. The addictions, 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 and I'm recovering addict, recovering. I never end up recovered. It's not over. 
It just continually processes therapies, uh, money, big industry, identify that psychosis, identify that problem, hey, go to your therapist, go get help and training, and the thing goes on and on and on, and we end up being a sick nation. Really. Our country is getting sicker. There's a couple more. The, the therapists extend their treatments over periods of many years, even after the original problem that provoked the client to seek counseling has been solved or forgotten. They go on for so long and the client becomes so dependent on the therapist that a special period of time, sometimes extending to six months or more, is required to get the client ready to leave. Um, Recovery, the code word for programs modeled for Alcoholics Anonymous, is marketed as a lifelong program. We've grown accustomed to the image of a person who has been sober for 40 years, standing up in an AA meeting saying, I am Bill, I am an alcoholic. Now all addicts are using the same approach. I am a sex addict. I'm a gambling addict. I'm a nicotine addict. I'm an anger addict. I'm a wife beating addict. I'm a child molesting addict. I'm a debt addict. I'm a self abuse addict. I'm an envy addict. I'm a failure addict. I'm an overeating addict. Whatever people are suffering from, this goes on and on and they are saying I am recovering but they don't come to the end and say I have been recovered it is over and it is done. Now think about it. Now when they said Barabbas, Barabbas, the problems just started. They didn't go away. Pilate washed his hands, right? Hey, I don't have anything to do with this. This is your problem. I'm done. Do you know what happened to Pilate? That was in 32 AD. 36 AD, he is called back to Rome. And guess what he does? Takes his life. Four years later, no one knows why. He's in trouble with the Roman Empire. Nobody knows why. But probably this thing plagued him, and he couldn't get away from it. He could not get away from it because there is one, th one place I need to go in order to have God deal with my, de my guilt in a very real and final way. It is over. And that is God. Pilate, come to Christ. He will take your guilt away. Pilate, you messed up. You sinned. Say the word, sinned. Sinned. I sinned. I have sinned. I'm held accountable for my action. I have sinned. I got to show up. Job 38, verse 2, when God wanted to talk to Job, he said, Job, stand up on your feet. I am talking to you. I love that portion. Again, in 40, I think it's verse 2 or verse 5, Job, stand up. I'm talking to you. Yeah, but you know, I got this disease and I'm heartbroken and everything. God is saying, yeah, I know all about it. Stand up. Show up. I'm talking to you. Like Pilate, you are guilty. You have crucified the Christ. But the good news, he's resurrected. He came for you, Pilate. He forgives you, Pilate. Receive and believe in him in your heart and he takes your guilt away by his blood. Rome, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more should the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, I know this is serious. I know you're, this was going to be fun, wasn't it? It didn't, didn't turn out that way, did it? <laughs> I think it might go down better if we had fun doing it. Yeah, but I might, might go down, I don't know, like... Well, some people are edgy. They're just about to leave, get out of here. <laughs> okay, listen. I, I just find it fascinating. Yeah, I just find it amazing. Uh, we have a little thing in our family called like shallow guilt. 
because we have a sensitive conscience about everything. Have I done that wrong or this right or that wrong and so on? And I agree, there is a guilt that is called a weak conscience in Romans chapter 14. There is such a thing in 2 Chronicles 34, I believe it's 17, where the king had a weak conscience like he was overly sensitive. That is not a spiritual conscience. In Romans 14, where it says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. There are things you can do that are not, God doesn't care about some things that you and I care about. He doesn't care about if you eat uh, uh, meat or vegetables. He doesn't care about if Sabbath is Saturday or Sunday. There are things he's not caring about in our religious world, but there are some things that he definitely does care about, and he gives you a good, very good and healthy conscience in life. Peace, freedom, and victory. If you are wrong, admit it. If you are guilty, say, I am guilty, I have sinned, I am selfish, I am wrong. Label it and say, I have cried out for Barabbas, but I am wrong. I need Christ. And when Christ fills us with his spirit, we are not guilty, we are free. We go from a bad conscience. People go, they go like bad decision, guilty conscience, they kind of rub it out, they try to get rid of it, deny it and everything, but then they don't get any further. They don't get beyond it. It's there. They can't get free from it. They, they are trying to excuse it away, write it away, read about it away, have better self-esteem, be more positive and optimistic and believe what the, these people in the world are saying. But God is saying, no, guilt is a very real thing and there's one way to get rid of it and that's not by explaining it away. That's by the blood of my son and the Holy Spirit filling you so you are free indeed. I mean really free. Okay, so judgment seat of the believer that we're going to be rewarded and all these great things that happen in our lives because of our freedom, how we control our fleshly appetites, we will be rewarded, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, we'll be rewarded for facing truth when it hits us right between the eyes and say, yes, God, I cried out for the lie, but I've been corrected. Truth is higher, truth is better. I want the truth even if it hurts me. I'll accept it as it is, and I expect you, God, to re release me in it and liberate me in it so that I love my husband, I love my wife, I love my children, I love my calling, I love my church, I love what you are doing, and I believe you for everything that you have said in this book. Guys, your name is Christ. Okay. Then we'll be judged how many souls we have brought to Christ, how we speak to others about him. We will be also how we look at the rapture and the second coming of Christ will be rewarded. How faithful we are, faithful we are to God's word and God's people. Now don't get angry at me. Don't get angry at me. I just love it. We have a place to go to. It's a safe place. It's a good place where my friends will tell me the truth. It's a place where our faith will grow. We're getting prepared to meet Christ and we will meet him one day. Don't get angry with me or the Bible because the Bible is telling you something that you may not like to hear. But, but you, are, you and I are learning it and being built up in it and we are capable of it. We are capable of holiness, capable of being a righteous person, capable of telling the truth, capable of walking in our faith, and capable of trusting God in every area. We will also be judged according to how we support others in our heart in the ministry. How we love each other, the people we don't see. All the pastors in the United States today that have been laboring in the word and how we support them in our hearts, they are our brothers and sisters. 
and then we'll be judged with our tongues in Matthew 12, 36, and give an account for the things. Not for, if you have sinned with your tongue, confess it. It'll never be brought up again. God has washed it away with, your, with his blood, and it is not brought up. But if you have a habit of gossiping and you get away with it, you get a habit of excusing or blaming or attacking the brethren, then, then that'll be before us as a great loss when we face God in James chapter 3. This is coming. And then there's the good news here. That's good news, but this is too. The marriage of the Lamb. I want to show it to you, Revelation 19. And we'll finish up here, probably, Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Do you want to see, the angel said, verse 7, there was a great noise of many waters like Niagara Falls, voice of many waters, hallelujah, Lord God omnipotent reigneth, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. <clears throat> Esther, when she was prepared to meet the king, I think she had to bathe for six months I'm sure that didn't help her skin out at all. She put on oils and perfumes and got prepared. I believe it was six months, wasn't it? Where she was prepared to be brought before the king. Well, that's an earthly story, but now we, the bride of Christ, we are being prepared now to meet Christ. Christ is in your life. Not your excuses and not your way out of responsibility, but God showing up and speaking to you in your heart and guiding you in what it is that he wants from you and saying, Lord, I want to show up. I want to be there. I want to believe you. And God will say, what I'm asking you is impossible. And you say, but God, with you it is possible. I will believe you. I will walk, walk by faith in what you say in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. So all of this beautiful uh, stuff comes upon us. We are arrayed, verse 8. She was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The character of Christ is what is covering us as his bride. And now this is the Bema Seat judgment where she is so beautiful all of these characteristics are adorning her, that she is dressed in this beautiful manifestation of God, that she has gotten in a life of faith. Your life of faith is uh, where it is producing the treasure in heaven that one day will adorn us, that we'll be clothed with his righteousnesses. It's a plural world word in verse 8. And he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper. So here we have marriage, and then we have marriage supper, or the reception. Are you called to the marriage reception? We had a wedding in here, and then down in the fellowship hall, we had the reception. You are called to the reception. What is the reception? All the friends and the family members come. It may be that the marriage supper of the Lamb goes into the millennium. It's in heaven during the tribulation, and then it may extend into the millennium. And the believers that survive the tribulation period will be guests in the house and the reception of the marriage of the Lamb. For this marriage supper of the Lamb, if it is a thousand years long, we don't really know. But if it is, it'll be just constant manifestation of Christ and his beautiful bride, which is us. Believers through the, through the centuries that have believed not the lie, but have believed the truth. They believe that I am a sinner, that I have sinned, and I confess it, and I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, and it's gone. 
and filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what the world cannot do it. They do not say you have sinned, that Christ forgives you, that God forgives you. Instead, it's like, I have made a mistake. I have a poor self-image. I have my problems. A psychologist has diagnosed it, given it a label. I go to therapy. I'm still in recovery. Hopefully, I'll get through it, and I'll be a super person. That's the idea. And they got labels for it, but it's not sin. It's labels, but they escape that. They don't like it. They don't talk about it. And I got to say to you and me, and I'm happy that I got hit between the eyes growing up in the Lord and saying, hey, you better call your sin a sin and grow up and get right with God and God will meet you there. But wait a minute. Hold it. Wait a minute. This means God is in the picture. This one is there is no God in the picture. This one is a label and an explanation, and therapy, and understanding yourself, and it's really not fair. I gotta read this one crazy story of this that's in our world. Let's see if I find it. Crazy. This man was beaten up, an old man was beaten in New York. He was... um, beaten up, the attacker ran away and was shot. The attacker was paralyzed by the bullet. He sued, yeah, here it is. The lawyer said he, 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 the society, okay, the argument of the attorney for the man who attacked the, the poor man that was beaten up at the subway, This man ran away, he was shot, paralyzed. He went to court to sue New York City, and it worked out this way, that the argument was that the man attacking him was driven to crime by economic disadvantages. The lawyer said he's a victim of the insensitivity of the man who shot him. Because of that man's callous disregard for the thief's plight as a victim, the poor criminal will be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He needs redress. The jury agreed. They gave him a large settlement, $4.2 million, several months later, the same man uh, was uh, arrested committing another robbery. Okay. Um... Mick Cummings was shot while fleeing the scene, permanently paralyzed. He sued and won $4.8 million in compensation from the New York Transit Authority. The man he mugged, a cancer patient, is still paying doctor bills. The Mick Cummings, the mugger, is now a multimillionaire. And the man he mugged is having a hard time paying his, his bills for his cancer. It's crazy how we cry out Barabbas, and and in principle, I don't know. Yeah, I know it's complicated. I know I worry, but you get the idea. The Twinkie defense. Have you ever heard of that one? This is a famous Twinkie defense. A lenient jury. A man murdered a fellow supervisor, and he acted irrationally. The attorney said it was Hostess Twinkies. The diet of the sugar made him act irrationally. A lenient jury jury bought the line and produced a verdict of voluntary manslaughter rather than murder. They ruled that the junk food resulted in diminished mental capacity, which mitigated the killer's guilt. He was out of prison before the mayor's next term would have been completed, who he also murdered. Okay. Crazy stories. I, what am I saying? I, I'm saying it's repeated in many ways. Many spins and turns and twists can be taken on the story of what we're looking at in this world. And actually, to be very honest, it's fun when you can say, I don't like it. I am guilty. Train me. You know, show me, 
Convict me. Lead me to the truth. I will take it. God, help me. I have sinned. I am responsible. I take the responsibility, and please set me free. And it's fun. When that freedom comes into your heart, you go, yeah, yeah, we can do this thing. I don't want to hear excuses. I want to believe that God can lead me beyond my capacity. I don't want you to make excuses for me. I can smell them out ahead of time. Don't give me an excuse. Give me faith. Teach me I can walk on water. Don't tell me that I can argue my way out of this and kind of blame it on him and blame it on them and blame it on my country and on my community and blame it on my race or my education or whatever it might be. Don't tell me that stuff. I want to know God. And I believe that if God can visit a man in prison and make him a mighty man like Joseph, then I believe that God can visit me in prison. And by the way, I don't want to go there. And I, I believe that if God can take a disabled person and get him to uh, rise up and go forward and believe God, and then I believe that, then tell me that, show me that. Like, wasn't that the Gump guy? What's his name? Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. What's the story about? Forrest Gump. He doesn't know much, but he's got character. Like he believes there's something about him that's refreshing to the American mentality. Like don't explain Forrest Gump away and marginalize him and push him to the side. He's the man that God made him to be and when he shows up, there's something that's gonna happen that is from the hand of God. That's what I wanna hear. That's what I wanna follow. That's what I wanna know. That's what I wanna believe. But they will shove this stuff down your throat, you and I, all day long, and say, Barabbas, set Barabbas free. And I will say, no, I want to know who Christ is. I want Christ to be the answer for my life. Okay? And then the, the next one we did, the tribulation of the world, and that one is coming up this spring too. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Maybe there wasn't any fun part in one way. I, I think you got it. You know what I'm saying. That you said, God said to the Jewish people, I will push your enemies out in front of you and they will be found liars to you. And you will walk on their high places. And you'll have a new birth. A rebirth in your marriage, a rebirth in your life, a rebirth in your church life, a rebirth in your Bible reading and your heart and your meditation, a spirit filling us and satisfying us and refreshing our mind, mind renewal and encouragement in the deep parts of our hearts. Our children need it. They need heroes, not excuses. They need a new life, a new pattern. They need, they need guidance in God. They need a mom and a dad. They need a, a coach in a basketball uh, team. They need a, a pastor, a leader, a youth worker. They need somebody who's going to be kind and loving and guide and lead them in the faith. Churches are the answer. It was once said by Francis Schaeffer that um, in the 18th century, Nobody knew anything about psychology, but a village pastor preaching the Bible would heal people of their problems, their pains. A village pastor in Europe in the 18th century, he would just open the Bible and people would get a message. They'd be comforted, they'd be challenged, they'd be led, they'd be spirit-filled, and it changed history. But now we are nursing each other in our problems and excusing each other as victims. A victim mentality is not one of freedom, but Christ and being a follower of him is. And if you're a believer tonight, God bless you and lead, lead you and I in this. And then if you're not a believer, become one tonight. Become one. Believe in him. Ask God. He will visit you. 
He will show you. He will open your eyes. He will lift you up on a rock higher than yourself. Higher than yourself. Yes. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Did anybody say the prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight? Just raise your hand. Anybody here? Just put up your hand. Yes to Jesus. Anybody? Yes, Jesus, I believe in you. Anyone on the Internet? Yes, I believe in you. I've never done it, but I believe in you. Huh? The Syrian family said they went to a Catholic church in Catonsville, and they prayed there. And, uh, you know, I think they're searching. That's exciting. Let's see what God does. That's amazing. Okay. Kindly to lean over to your neighbor and say to your neighbor something edifying and kind and love them and encourage them.
you. Father, thank you tonight. Thank you. Jesus met Peter. Jesus met Peter. Peter just said, I'm a sin-filled man. Thank you, God, that there's mercy, forgiveness, cleansing, freedom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sin has been put away at the cross. Bless our lives tonight, God, with a remembrance and a meditation on this truth that we heard tonight. We thank you tonight. Thank you for being with us, guiding us. Bless our week. We pray once again for the play and all that takes place Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The preparation, the prayer, the intercession, the anointing, the gathering. Just touch, bring many new people here, Lord Jesus. People that are lost. They will be people who say yes to Jesus Christ. Born again, washed in the blood. We thank you tonight. Bless our nights. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.